so what I'm going to do is to continue um, talking about the proposed roles for the ILSI Research Foundation. There are two things that you, I'm sure that you got away from those two presentations. One, I was actually staggered that even in rural areas, the consumption of vitamin A leafy greens is plunging, and the consumption of sugar and fat is increasing, which points to the role, but also to the ethical obligations of the global food industry. Because clearly, processed foods and the global food industry are right at the interface of global climate change, agriculture, and the consumer. People are not going to be eating crops off the field. There is going to be an intermediate stage. But my role here in presenting um, Dave's um, slides is twofold. First, I will introduce the ILSI Research Foundation, especially SimSans, and then point to the collaborative roles between SimSans and AGMIP and what we can do together. So just very briefly, ILSI International Research um, International Life Sciences um, Institute and ILSI Research Foundation is a nonprofit worldwide organization which actually brings together academia, industry, and government agencies in a kind of tripartite model. ILSI is not a advocacy or a lobbying group. It is a research group, and ILSI Research Foundation is very much devoted to research in a number of interesting areas to do with food and nutrition. So ILSI Research Foundation is distinct. It does research, and it has a number of thematic areas that go all the way from food and water safety through toxicology and disk science, food and nutrition, and now to sustainable agriculture and nutrition security through SimSans. I should also say, and this is of interest to all of you because you've got um, centers established all over the world and are dealing with various regions, uh, that ILSI is also a global network. Uh, ILSI Global is in Washington, D.C., but there's also ILSI North America, Mexico, Mesoamerica, Sudandino, Brazil, Argentina, Europe, and so on. You see all the distribution of the ILSI branches around the world, and all those ILSI branches are engaged in their own activities specific to that region. Um, SimSans um, is one of the centers uh, within ILSI Research Foundation. We have another center, CIRA, the Center for Environmental Risk Assessment, and a Center for Safety Assessment of Food and Feed, and those centers deal with GMO crops and issues of biosafety and risk. Uh, there is a bit of an overlap, in fact, between the various agencies and organizations represented here and SimSans, because the SimSans Advisory Council does include people from FAO, Jim Jones is on it, uh, Josette Davis from UC Davis World Food Center, and then we have a presentation from ILSI, Mark Rosa Grant is the chair, and also private industry. So again, what you see here is a kind of combination of the private sector, public universities, government agencies, or in international agencies, very much within the kind of ILSI tripartite framework. And as a result, we do a number of collaborative publications, increasingly in the area of common interest. The one that um, was a collaborative publication involving many people, some of them present here, was this extreme weather and resilience of the global food system report, um, which Dave Gustafsson also contributed to and about which we just heard a few minutes ago. So let me um, show you how the various cooperative and collaborative activities can fit together. Uh, this is the kind of system I have been drawing up over the past couple of days. Um, and you see here, for us, the pathway goes from climate to agriculture to food security and diets and ultimately to nutrition and health. The point Jess was making that in public health, people very often look at the diets and go back to climate change to see how the current diets predict climate change or are, have an impact on the environment. We can think of it three ways, actually. We can think of it in a standard public health way, going from current diets to climate change. Or we can look at it, as this workshop has been doing, going from climate change to diets. There is a third way, which is kind of more interventionist way, which was partly explained by Jean-Francois Susanna when he was here, and that is we can decide what kind of a diet we want in the future and then go back to the agricultural and food systems to give it to us. So three ways, from diets to climate, from climates to diet, and from the ideal diets 
to potential interventions. Take your pick. There are going to be a number of those approaches with their proponents and so on. But there's one important thing. So if we go directly from agriculture and crop and animal modeling as we have been doing, there is a direct impact of that on subsistence farming and consumption of foods locally. But as we have just mentioned, with megacities, a number of people are cut off from means of food production, and they certainly do not eat the food they produce. So we need to take the megacities into account, and increasingly, seemingly, we even need to take rural Ethiopia into account because farmers are increasingly buying the foods and not necessarily consuming the foods they produce. So here you have this interface about which we have not really been talking much about, but the food industry is involved at various levels. On one hand, the grain trade, someone is buying all this wheat and the soy and the corn and so on. Then you have the processing, and some of the corporations are going to be the biggest global purchasers of, say, sugar or corn. And then those foods get processed, so you have the processors, and then you have retail. And of course, retail is changing. We submitted a proposal to explore the retail situation in India. So it's not subsistence farming anymore. Some of those farmers may be going to buy Snickers at Carrefour. So everything is changing, and we need to take those things into account and to some extent include those things in our modeling. And then the food system metrics have been introduced very nicely. These are the ones we use. I use this kind of provisional um, form, uh, format of nutrient density, cost, cultural appropriateness, and environmental impact. And I think those things conform to the metrics that Jess presented because we are looking at diversity, we're looking at nutrient density, we're also looking at cost. And of course, cultural acceptability uh, for the various diets is paramount. So this is where we see potential collaborations with ILSI and SimSans because in fact, a lot of the companies involved in this are in fact ILSI member companies, especially on the food processing side. So these are the unique components which ILSI RF can bring to this expanded network. We can um, do have contacts with um, the food industry groups. We do have access to the various metrics because in fact our ILSI branches are working on some of those issues. Companies are collecting dietary intake assessment data in various parts of the world and my kind of personal hope is that ILSI Research Foundation will become a trusted repository of open data that companies will donate to it as a public good. So ILSI Research Foundation already has access to the crop composition database, which could be of interest, and we will have access, I'm hoping, to dietary intake database and nutrient composition databases for different parts of the world, which we will, what's the diplomatic word here, pressure the member companies to donate to ILCRF as a global public good. So this is going to be very interesting because then the kind of data that you have on the climate can be then merged with dietary intake data to make this kind of seamless bridge going from climate change to agriculture, to food industry, to diet quality, without forgetting the ultimate goal, which really is global public health. So I'm grateful to Christina for having pointed out there are a number of things that go beyond diets. There are a number of other factors that contribute to nutrition, security, and health. Food is one of them, but food is not the only one of them. So this is a kind of provisional framework for a collaborative structure, pointing out the various things that ILSI RF can do with its stakeholders and its expertise in different areas. So I'm going to stop here.